Hello folks. Welcome back to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. This next project on the bench is a Seiko Lordmatic TV dial from August of 1972, specifically model 5606-5070. This watch belongs to a friend of mine. He gave it to me to service and I've had it for a couple months, several months actually. And uh, cause we've been working on other stuff on the channel and I'm sure he's tired of waiting. So uh, <laughs> it's time to we get into this watch. So we're gonna do some function testing here. And when we pull the crown on this watch, this watch has a hacking feature. Uh, and what that does, it stops the seconds hand, as you can see while we're setting the time. On these 5606 movements, there is one weak point in these watches. And that is the quick set for the day and date. This one is working flawlessly. And the reason that is, I mean, full disclosure is because I, I worked on this watch last year because it had the problem and I did the repair to the quick set function. And as you can see there, it's running fine. We'll detail that uh, later and I'll show you what that weak point is and what the fix is for it. But this watch already had that done. I did not service it last year, as you can see by this time graph we're reading, <laughs> I definitely didn't service this watch last year. I just fixed that, but it's running slow. 175 amplitude. Oh, goodness. Dropped a 135 amplitude, about four milliseconds of beat error. Ooh, down to 118. So yeah, this watch is most certainly due for a service. So this TV dial case is pretty interesting. We're going to go ahead and remove the case back on this, as you can see there, we got to get at it from both sides here and we're going to go ahead and use some plastic to protect it. And now we can lift that out in the movement and dial and everything will come out with it. Just like you see there. So the front side of this, the crystal on this TV dial is quite unique. There's the, the case. Crystal's got a few scratches on it and we can remove this crystal gasket. That is a Viton style gasket, which thankfully it's in fantastic shape. We can clean it with some IPA and reuse it because that's not the easiest nor the cheapest gasket to source. So to remove the, the stem, that little lever there with the arrow pointing to it is the setting lever. So we'll press down on that and pull our stem out. Just take a look at this thing. And uh, the Crown gaskets on those, uh, to be frank, are not the easiest ones in the world to replace, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Now we can pull the movement out. So yeah, it's a real pretty 5606 movement. You can see we have the hack engaged because we pulled the crown out so that balance wheel was not spinning. Here's the rest of that case. We'll take a look at the markings on the back of it here. And that it says 28, so that's August of 1972. There's no watchmaker marks inside of this thing. So don't know if anyone's ever been in it. Um, probably at some point in its life. I mean, this watch is quite old, but uh, it's most certainly needs some work done to it now. So we'll put the crown back in, and I'm going to set the hands to 12 so I can re remove them, but I'm just going to wait for that seconds hand to make its way to 12 o'clock. Then I'll pull the crown back out in engage the hacking mechanism and then the hands will stop there and now i can remove them without uh without that second hand moving around on me so i'm just being very very careful with my levers here just to make sure i don't damage these hands and as i pull the plastic off what i don't notice you may have noticed it right there i went to put the hands in my little tray and i tipped it over and i'm like wait a minute where's the second hand <laughs> just not there. <laughs> so I checked my plastic and sure enough, it's stuck to it. And that can happen sometimes. So, um, uh, generally I, I try to do my best to check that, but clearly I didn't there and that came off with it. I have lost a chronograph sub register dial or sub register hand that way before. So, um, definitely we're checking plastic when you pull that off to make sure your hands don't stick to it. But when we loosen the dial feet, you saw the dial, kind of pop loose there. And what's cool about this one is that with that dial ring, the dial spacer, it kind of acts as a handle. So it makes removing the dial very simple. 
So we'll put the case next to it and we'll magnify this. You can see two eight on the case and two seven on the dial. That is July and August respectively of 1972. So we have an original dial. Very cool. So now we can begin disassembly of the movement. And as I start in on this, you'll notice on these, on this Seiko movement, the 56 series is uh, is quite different from most of the Seiko movements we've had on this channel. We've covered a lot of them. We've, we've had the, the 61 series, both the chronograph and non chronograph. We've had, uh, I don't know if I've had a 63 on there. That's not too far off. I've got one other 63 in the drawer. Um, we've had some 7,000 series movements. All that stuff came after this, but this one does not share much of hardly anything in common with those. Um, it's a lot more like a Swiss movement than a, what we're typically used to see with, you know, other ones. So when I'm, when I was pulling this balance off, I noticed it, I thought it was real sticky at first. And so I just barely touched that balance wheel and got it off in hindsight. I know that I had my hack engaged, so I had the hacking lever barely touching the balance wheel. That's why it stuck there. No big deal. So now we can remove this little pin. I'm doing it underneath some plastic um, and uh, just making sure that little pin, it's a clip, but just making sure that that doesn't fly off on me and we can begin disassembly of this thing. Uh, this one, again, is quite unique and especially the keyless works. Uh, quite complicated, actually for, you know, for what it is for a standard day date complication that, you know, later movement models really simplified it, but this one's not the easiest one in the world to do. And actually, um, I, I remembered while I was working on this watch that the very first watch I ever did a top to bottom rebuild on the very first one I ever did was a 5606, a Lord Matic. Again, I, I was a vintage Seiko nut long before I started working on watches and I had a Lord Matic that needed to be serviced and it was a good candidate. So I figured what the heck in hindsight, probably not the smartest thing I've ever done. You know, if I would recommend a movement to someone to start on, it probably wouldn't be this one. Although I got through it, someone else can too, but uh, there are easier ones, but you'll see as we take this thing apart, you know, there, there's a lot going on even on the dial side of this watch. And when we reassemble it, I'll, go into a lot more detail on that. But on these 56 series movements, there's a lot of history. So the 56 series was the base for the Seiko Lord Maddox, which they made from 1968 to 1978. And then there was also variants of the 56 series movements that they used in King Seiko, which is the next level up. And then Grand Seiko, which is the next level up after that. And so the, Lord Maddox had 56, uh, 56, 01, 05, and 06. Uh, and all these movements will list off the ones ending in one or time only. Uh, 05 is the date only, and 06s are, have a day and date. So with Lord Maddox, you had the 56, 01, 05, and 06 uh, from 68 to 78. Although if I remember right, I think they only made the 56, 05, the date only, they made that for like three or four years. That's it. But then in King Seiko and all these were Sua made all these. Um, they had the 56, 21, 56, 25 and 26. And then grand Seiko had the 56, 41, 45 and 46, all based on the standard 56 series movement. Uh, there was also a 56, 19, which was a dual time. And, um, 56, 25, and 26, which were chronometer rated movements, all based on this architecture on this watch. Dany Sikosha came out and then they made 52 series movements that were in Lord Matic. Uh, and on those, they were Lord Matic specials is what they called those. And then uh, they also did them in King Seikos. I don't know if they did Grand Seikos on those or not, but there is a long history and by the way, that part I'm removing is the quick set for the day and date. That's the part I repaired. I'll explain that repair here in a bit when we reassemble it. But there's a long history of those things uh, on those movements. And uh, Lord Maddox are just fantastic watches. So um, they're good quality. They're a step above the standard release models and below as, as far as, I don't know if you want to call it quality or 
you just, in the, in the, in the tier of ex- <laughs> how expensive it is and how regarded it is or whatever, you know, it was the standard ones. They had the Lord Maddox, uh, and Lord Maddox kind of replaced the, the Seiko Maddox watches from, um, prior, uh, especially really prevalent in mid sixties and earlier. Um, but, uh, they had the regular ones. Then you had Lord Maddox and a lot of different versions. The original ones, first couple of years were very standard. And then, you know, 68, 69, and then starting in 70, 71, they started coming out with some really more unique and kind of funky ones like this TV dial and a bunch of other ones, um, faceted crystals, um, more intricate finishing on the dials and indexes and, uh, really some really cool stuff. Um, on those when they had actual glass in there for the crystals, um, outside of like TV dials, which most of those are still uh, acrylic, but, um, there is just a bunch of different variations and you can find them even still for, you know, even some, if you get lucky, I mean, you can find a decent one for under a hundred dollars up to, uh, you know, 300, 350 for an exquisite one, maybe, and maybe even more depending upon rarity or whatever. But, uh, mechanically, they are extremely good watches. And so, um, I love these things and I may be kicking myself, you know, and do it, not doing myself a favor by saying this on video, but, uh, value for money. And especially if you want to get into restoring vintage watches and all that, in my opinion, just my opinion, Seiko Lord Maddox are really overlooked, um, quality for the movement for what you pay for it, for the case, the dials, they're just fantastic. Some of those faceted crystals can be a pain, uh, and expensive to source. Um, I've actually gone through and bought some that are the right crystal, but a bit larger and sanded the crystals down to fit because you just can't find the original part. So, um, crystals can be one thing (laughs) on some of the really intricate ones, but man, they're cool. But, um, there we go. Get, I actually talked all the way through the d- dial side of that, but that is the first reverser idler wheel. That's part of the automatic works. And you saw the ratchet wheel move when I removed that. There was a bit of tension from the ratchet wheel on that. But with that out of the way, we can remove wind from the watch just by pulling the click spring back and then just using my screwdriver on the watch, ratchet wheel screw. So now we can disassemble the pallet fork and we need to move the pallet fork bridge first. And so as I edited this video, I'll just be honest with you. The, uh, you know, it came out originally as like an hour and 25 minutes or something. And so I said, well, how do I shorten this? I need to take, I mean, that's long, even for my videos, I mean, for a non chronograph, I mean, that's long. So a lot of the stuff when I'm, when I'm removing screws now, uh, like on here, you'll just see, I didn't, I, I kind of cut the footage out of me unscrewing it because it's pretty redundant, but you'll see me removing the screw. So I, I, I actually was able to trim a few minutes of the video off by just by taking that footage out. So now we can remove the click spring and the click and the click spring is actually one piece. It's just one wire and with a little hook on the end of it that's raised up that the ratchet wheel engages with it's super clever. It probably could not get any more simple but completely effective. Um, super cool. Very, very Seiko. So this spring right here, um, is this thing. It was born with wings. So this is the spring for the hacking lever. And, uh, I've removed that as fast as I can because that spring Ask me how I know that thing flies. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I cut my teeth on a 5606 movement and, uh, I found that spring later, but that one can be touchy to say the least. So now we're down to removing our bridge. And so this one piece bridge, it's one piece for the barrel, for the wheel train and for the automatic works. It's all under one bridge, which means that there's a heck of a lot of pivots to to align during reassembly. So that is the second reverser idler wheel. And this monstrosity is called the differential wheel. Uh, those are pieces for the automatic works and take a look. There's a lot going on on that wheel, but now we can pull apart our wheel train. So here's our fourth wheel and then extend pivot on that wheel is what the seconds hand physically attaches to. 
This is our second wheel. It's got two pinions on it. That lower one is the driving pinion. Um, and while I was rambling on during the dial side of the watch, actually I was uh, picking this up. I didn't like how that gear was in my, I would have bent it if I clamped down on it. So I'm kind of readjusted, but the Canon pinion on this watch is not friction fit and driven by the second wheel. Uh, the second, the, the driving gear on that second wheel drives the minute wheel on the other side and that engages the Canon pinion. So that Canon pinion is not friction fit. It just simply comes off. But with the rest of those parts gone, now the last piece to come out is our hacking lever. And that lever is what physically touches the balance wheel when you pull the stem out. And that is what stops the movement from running. Lastly is just our little post there for the can for the setting lever. I forgot that when we did the dial side of the watch, so I made sure I got that before we finished. So now we can disassemble the barrel. There we go. We get our barrel out and that mainspring does not look terrible. I mean, it's, we've definitely seen a lot worse, but I'm really trying my best here not to replicate what happened on a previous video where I sent the barrel arbor flying and I went and bought a $20 replacement part only to find the original one as soon as I bought the part. But there we go. That came out without too much fuss. And now we can remove the spring. So I, what I do is I clear my bench of all my parts and everything. So as the spring unwinds and gets longer and longer, I'm not knocking any parts off my bench, but we got that removed. This is an original spring. The bridle on that spring is about twice as thick as the actual main spring. And then I'm just I'm seeing if I can align this spring up to the camera in such a way, just so you can see the flatness. And that's looking really nice. The spring doesn't feel worn. It's not bumpy. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and reuse it. Now we have to disassemble the bridge here. There is a bridge for the reduction wheel in the automatic works held on by two screws. So we'll go ahead and get that removed. Also on this bridge is the crown wheel, but that crown wheel is permanently affixed to the bridge. So we do not and really cannot remove that. So that'll stay there during cleaning and everything else. We will re-lubricate it, but uh, the crown wheel does not get disassembled on the 5606 movement. Ugh. all right, folks. So now these are die fix settings, not die shock like the balance wheel. And you've seen a bunch of times, these little buggers are called die fix and they're evil. I'm just going to say it. They're just evil. <laughs> so anyone who's done one of these before knows exactly what I'm talking about. So what these cap jewels on this watch here, it has die fix settings on the wheel train for the upper escape wheel and third wheel pivots. And that spring is just awful. Uh, what I've got is some peg wood that I've kind of cut to an angle. So I'm holding it flat on top of that. I'm using that to keep that spring from flying out. And, uh, but I want to get it put in if those, if, one of those feet kind of get out of place. They can, those go flying that original movement. I worked on the very first one I ever did. Again, this is one of the reasons I would not recommend it. I lost both those springs, ordered two replacements, lost one of those. <laughs> so, I mean, they're just, they're just the worst. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, but, uh, that one actually came off there. I've done a lot of them since then, but even still, um, I'm as careful, like for whatever, you know, you should be really careful about everything you're doing on watches, but on these, oh, they taught me a lesson. So like when I do these, I I'm just like, I'm as careful as I could possibly be. And I'm using my fun, that tool there in my left hand, I'm, I'm a lefty. So that's why everything's kind of backwards in my video, but that tool in my left hand is the, my finest oiler that I have. And I'm just kind of using that to manipulate the spring while I hold it down with pegwood. I'm just trying to get those seated back into place so that I can run those through cleaning. But with that cap jewel removed, I can peg those jewels on both sides, clean them up. And uh, now this thing's disassembled. I'm just taking a look at it through the microscope and uh, just kind of bear with me as I adjust the focus. As the elevation changes on the main plate, my, cam my camera doesn't autofocus. I have to do it manually, but 
I have this backlight. Hey, while I'm here, so shout out to a channel called Watch with Mike. He doesn't know I'm doing this, but um, I've talked to him in comments a few times. He recently did a video where he showed this little $20 handheld little light thingy. I think it normally mounts to cameras or whatever, but uh, he showed a couple uses for it. I bought one through his affiliate link. I, I love it. It's fantastic. Or you can check jewels with it, all kinds of stuff. Speaking of jewels, you can see the chip in this jewel. This is the lower pivot jewel for the differential wheel in the automatic works. And this is the, you can see that bearing is, or that bushing is really worn. It's very oval. That is the lower barrel arbor bushing in the main plate. That is the other wear point, heavy wear point. Uh, the quick sets, the weak point, that wear point on these 56 series movements, I have found that I, and all the ones I've done, I've never found, uh, I'm sure they exist, but I've never had an upper barrel arbor bushing really have a lot of slop in it, but the lower ones do on these movements for whatever reason. So um, we're going to address these two issues. I'm going to press out that lower differential wheel bushing. And now it's new tool time, folks. Check this out. I wish I could put in sounds of angels as I open this box. <laughs> I love new tool time. This is a micrometer that I recently picked up. I've been wanting one of these for quite a long time. They're not cheap. And this one took about three and a half weeks to arrive, but this measures highly accurately to in one one hundredths of a millimeter. So I'm just showing you this here just to show you how I would measure things out to find a replacement jewel. I've actually got uh, a scrap main plate for a 56 series that has the, a jewel I can use. So I don't need to use this tool, but I'm showing the tool off. So I measure the pivot size and I'm measuring the outside diameter of the jewel. And that's 1.09 millimeters. I know from this angle, it looks like the zero is a bit off. Um, I'm sitting at an angle to this thing while filming. So I aligned it so I could read it zeroed. And it looks right to me, but the camera is more straight on. It looks like it's about half of half a hundredth off, but, uh, Here's my replacement jewel and I'm or removing that jewel awkwardly. And then I'm going to put in my replacement jewel. And I just wanted to show you. So I would make, you know, this thing here and the outside diameter is going to be 1.09, just like the other one. So if I was measuring to replace a jewel, I didn't already have, I'd measure the pivot to know the inside diameter and add two hundredths of a millimeter for, in, for, um, uh, the, uh, side shake. And then, match the outside jewel or larger if I'm going to ream a hole. And then I can, that's how I'd find the correct size to replace jewels. So I'm very fortunate. Thank you to the kindness of the patrons of this channel. I was able to finally uh, put everything together to order that. And I really think that's going to help me a lot moving forward. So again, I didn't need that tool on this thing, but it recently came in and I just wanted to show it off and show you how I'd measure jewels and pivots. You can measure balance staffs. I mean, all kinds of stuff. That tool is specifically the measuring table on that and everything is specifically for watchmaking, but it's just a highly accurate micrometer. So we got that jewel seated into place. Lovely. Now we're going to go ahead and push this bushing out. And what I'm going to do on this is replace this with a jewel. I'm not going to do that upper jewel. Um, there's really no need that bushing is still in fantastic shape. I mean, it's perfect. So um, I've always found the lower ones on these movements to have all the slop in it. And what's awesome about this is this jewel, although they don't advertise it as such, but the jewel upgrades for the 61 series movements. I've done several on the chronographs on this channel. The lower barrel arbor jewel on this movement is the exact same size. So um, even like when they sell those, they don't, I've, they, most of them don't mention they also fit the 56 series movements, but they do. So Got that replaced. Also, while doing inspection, this is the second reverser idler wheel. There's two jewels in this part, and one of them on one side, you can see, has got two significant cracks in it. So, I mean, that's just for the automatic works. Technically, that thing would probably still work, but got a replacement here, different color, and it's very dirty. I haven't cleaned it yet, but uh, hold it at an angle. You can see it's got two different jewels in that. It's pretty interesting. But uh, we'll flip this one over, and you can see this one here is not broken. 
So we have a replacement part for that. We'll clean that up good. It's pretty filthy right now, but there's that. And then on the pallet fork, I was doing inspection. I was cleaning the faces of the jewels and that's not dirt. That's like a channel kind of cut into that. It's groove and wear, and it's really hard to see, but there is the slightest of chips on the very tip of that stone. And that's right where the escape wheel rides. So we have a replacement pallet fork. So lastly, this is the third wheel and we'll kind of zoom in to this upper pivot and you can see the top of that pivot is flat. Um, that sits in a capped jewel and typically those things will have a tipped or dome pivot and it's same thing on the escape wheel. If we zoom into that upper pivot on the escape wheel, it's flat. Usually when they're on capped jewels, that pivot is tipped or domed. And so the very, very, only the very tip of it actually touches with these being flat and worn. Uh, you have much more surface area making contact and thus more friction with more friction. We'll see a bit less amplitude. So we're going to go with it. My jacket tools, uh, the lantern on it is damaged the one of the appropriate size to address these. So we're just going to go with it as is we will see a bit less amplitude, but, uh, it'll still run fine, but that was something I'll address later on. That way I can show you those repairs later. You can see my worn out finger cots from pegging the jewels with pegwood. I've worn through my finger cots, but <laughs> oh well. But we got all those parts in the tray. All repairs are done, pre-cleaning's done, and we can move it over to the cleaning machine. This is my Elmo cleaning machine. It's a manual four-stage machine, and then with a one wash, three rinses, and a dryer. I'm very fortunate to have it. It's overkill for my needs. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you so, so much. A heartfelt thank you to the members of the Patreon community who really support this channel. Um, like things like that tool and project watches and parts really wouldn't be possible without your help. A special shout out to Nathan, Kelly, Alan, Laura, Jen, and Steve, our newest members. Thank you all so, so much for joining. I've said it before and it may sound redundant, but it means the world to me. I really do appreciate it. If you'd like to take a look, uh, please feel free. There's a link on your screen. You can sign up for free. I completely understand, you know, uh, you don't have to be a paid member. That's not possible for a lot of folks. And I completely get it. Um, I try to upload contents on there. Uh, a lot of it for viewable by everyone. Uh, Patreon members can see exclusive ad free videos, uh, but there's a lot of benefits just for being a free member. If you're interested, please go over there and have a look. Thank you so much. So, we got the jewel assembly for the balance bridge assembled and lubricated. So we're going and putting that in place and I'm fiddling around with my screwdrivers a little bit, trying to kind of get situated because I'm trying to not move the shot out of the microscope camera view. <laughs> I'm just being a little bit fiddly with it, but there we go. I managed to get the spring in thankfully. And I'll do the exact same thing to the bottom side. Just give it a puff of air and just take a look. I've got the balance bridge on, or the bridge on as well to do those evil diafix settings. But taking a look here at the hairspring, it looks nice and flat. It's good between the regulator pins. I like to look at it from multiple angles. Sometimes it'll look good from one angle, but then at a different angle, you'll see a bend in it. So, all right, back to these. And again, I'm going to do both of these. I'm going to keep all the footage. There's zero edits in here. This is real time. In real life, sometimes you struggle with it. Sometimes you don't, but I'm just going to show you how it went for me. So take in mind, I'm going to assemble these dry. So I'm not going to pre-lubricate that capstone before I put it in. Um, it just adds another level of difficulty. Even if you don't have any issues with the spring, you can't, if you lubricate that capstone, and actually I'm trying to move that spring out of the way real quick. I'm at a weird angle here. I'm going to move this thing in camera. It's going to be awkward, but yeah, I'm just kind of readjusting so I can push that spring back. But if you oil the, the jewel before you put it in, you can't disturb that oil. If you smear it or something like I'm going to put this jewel in and it's going to be a little bit off center, just like that. If I had oiled that stone beforehand, I've already messed up and I got to take it apart and reclean it and start over. But with it dry, if, if you have the capability of lubricating it from the backside, it's a lot easier. So that's what I'm going to do. I have an automatic oiler and you don't actually have to have an automatic oiler in order to do it. I've seen people use, um, like extended pivots on an escape wheel that have a, you know, a really long skinny pivot or a balance staff. 
But if you have something thin enough, you can put a dab of oil on the backside of that setting and use a pivot or something and to press that oil inside the setting. That's really all, all an automatic oiler is doing. Um, and so that's just, yeah, you don't have to do it, but if you lubricate the, the jewel with it in there, you got to be way more careful putting it in place. And I've, I've taken me five or six attempts before to get one without disturbing the oil on the jewel. Otherwise it won't sit in center of that setting. When you put the jewel in, it'll be smeared everywhere and it won't work right. So, ah, oh, there he goes. Finally, finally got that spring in. I almost got it off camera, but thanks for hanging with me on that. That other one was the third wheel. This is our escape wheel setting. So again, I'm using my finest oiler and holding it down with some peg wood to try to bring that thing back enough to get that lip out from that setting. And there it goes. And then once that's done, now I can kind of get an oiler in there and push this spring back gently while keeping those, both those feet still in place. Now, okay, good. Now I could put that jewel in. Here we go. We'll drop in the jewel, kind of adjust it, put it in place. And again, if I'd pre-lubricated it, that would not have been good enough and I'd have screwed it up and I would have had to redo it. You got to almost drop it in dead square and it's not easy with the shape of those springs. And if one of those springs comes off, my goodness, are they a pain to do? So, okay. A little bit of pegwood again, <laughs> you're going back on here and you know, some people may think, Adam, you're just, I mean, this is just taking forever. Why is this in here? And really, honestly, I'm probably doing it for, you know, for those of you out there who are kind of in my boat that, you know, work on these as a hobby or do whatever, or maybe you're a professional, but if you've done one of these, you know, right. There's just, yeah, you've, you've been through it. You've taken your lumps and you know about these evil die fix settings. Funny enough, I read a deal once where I was on a forum and they were talking about die fix settings and someone said, yeah, they were looking up some history and they said, yeah, they were invented during World War II. And it was a torture device for watchmakers. And that kind of made me laugh because like, it kind of is a torture for watchmakers. I mean, they were obviously joking, but you know, there's so much easier ways to do this, but they love their die fix. There's more than one type of die fix. These, I, I hate these the worst. There's other ones that are nearly as bad, but ugh, die fix settings, but we got through it. So now I'm using my automatic oiler and I'm applying some lubrication to both of those. And I'll check them with a, a backlight behind them just to make, and check the, the oil ring in the middle and make sure they're good. And they are. And I actually adjust my automatic oil a little bit to drop a little bit less oil in there. Like that escape wheel does not take much oil. Like you don't put the same amount of oil on an escape wheel that you do, you know, on your main spring barrel or on your center wheel. So now we can go ahead and finish assembling the rest of this plate. That is our differential wheel. And I lubricated that pivot before it goes in and I drop it into place and I do a horrible job of dropping it in place. I'm like a mile off, but let me readjust it. There we go. That's where it belongs. Now I'm going to lubricate this pivot here before we put the bridge on. And I could have oiled it after I put the bridge in place, but not a big deal. You can see my hands get just terribly shaky. But there we go. We'll get that into place and I'll bring that over and move it onto the other post. Okay, cool. Now there's two screws that hold this down. So we'll get that put into place. Second one's tight and I'll just go back and double check the first one real quick. Okay. Bridge is assembled and ready for use. And what I like to do, I like to get all these little sub assemblies assembled as much as possible before kind of putting the watch together. And I don't know about you, but like, you know, if you're doing something and you kind of get into a groove and I find I lose that groove of like, if I got to stop, and then, you know, I put the wheel training together, everything else. And then I got to go back and spend 15 minutes putting my bridge together or, you know, putting the main, mainspring barrel together. I lose my groove. So, you know, I like to get all that done beforehand and that way I can just drop them in. That's why I like to lubricate my balance jewels beforehand. That way, when I drop it in and it's done, it's just done. I see tons of people lubricate them after they install it. And that's totally fine. I just, you know, I do it the way I do it. So we got our braking grease in and some mainspring grease on the base of the 
mainspring barrel and now we pop our spring in and I used my fingers there because it was a real, there was the, the drum on the mainspring winder wouldn't fit all the way into the barrel. It kind of set on the edge. And so I, I used my fingers just in case it didn't want to pop down. The spring went flying. It wouldn't fly in my face kind of thing. I could catch it with my fingers, but it went in fine. And I'm applying a bit more grease to the top side of this. And my OCD is getting the better of me trying to make sure that grease is spread all the way across. And then some, I'm applying some HP 1300 here to the inside of that, where the barrel arbor is going to rotate inside that barrel. Now we can put our arbor in and I like to stage my arbor next to it with the hook in the right spot. That way I can grab it and the hooks already oriented in the, where it needs to engage with the eyelet. And so that arbor actually went in quite nice. Just give it a quick turn there to make sure that it's engaging with the eyelet on that mainspring and it looks great. So a little bit more lubrication on the arbor here where it is going to rotate around the barrel lid. And so someone had left a comment and they said, I never put in the click for the, that you get when you put close the cap. So, uh, I'm adding that click in here. So you'll, you'll hear it real quick. There you go. My obligation has been fulfilled. You heard the click. <laughs> so now we can go ahead and begin assembly of the dial side of the movement. And so this spring I was rambling on earlier this spring is the spring for the minute wheel. Technically speaking, you don't have to remove this to service the watch. It will not come out during cleaning and or anything else. I could have left this in, but for the sake of just removing every part for the sake of the video to show you everything coming out, there you go. It didn't, when I reinst reinstalled it, it, it looked like it needed to sit back into that groove a little bit more. There we go. Just kind of making sure it's kind of recessed in there all the way. And here's our minute wheel. I'm going to go ahead and lubricate the pivot for the minute wheel. And that spring is going to kind of engage with that on that pivot. Okay. So now I find reinstalling these or removing them. I mean, you got to get the pivot behind the spring and then kind of move it in place to when you remove it, it's really handy to kind of pull down on the wheel or move it in a downward direction as you're lifting it away. And it, it kind of helps it clear that spring. But now we are going to go ahead and begin assembly of the keyless works. And I'm lubricating the stem here. And as I begin doing this, the reason I'm assembling the movement this way is because there's a hack. And so because of the hack, if the hack is engaged by default, like if, you know, if you didn't have the crown in or you didn't have the key looks works in the hacking lever is going to be in the engaged position. And if it is, you can't install your balance. And so what I like to do is to, on this movement is to, I'm going to install the keyless works and everything there. That way I can have the crown in when we go to install the balance wheel later, I can make sure the crown's pushed in that way. The hack is disengaged and there won't be anything impeding me from installing the balance wheel. So with that done, we've got the winding pinion and sliding clutch lubricated. I'm a, applying those to the stem and I've kind of have the stem in there like that to hold those because right now there's nothing keeping those winding stem and sliding clutch from just falling through the movement. If the stem isn't there. So there we go. Those are installed. And now we can put together this keyless works and there's a lot going on on these keyless works. So uh, we'll kind of go through it. I, I always find it best. I, I the way I'm, it kind of works in my head is I'm thinking of it in layers. So um, you'll, you'll see kind of things are stacked on top of other things as we continue to build up this keyless works. So we're going to start off with the yoke. We've applied some lubrication to the post, some grease to the sliding clutch where the yoke's going to engage. And I'm going to apply a bit more grease here where the setting lever is going to engage with it. And the setting lever has kind of two levels to it. And so the part of the setting lever that's going to in, you know, make contact right there is kind of covered up. So, um, it's just so much easier to do it now. A little bit of grease here inside where the setting lever post is going to go. And we can put that post in. And the tip of that post is where the setting lever is going to rotate around. So I'm going to put just a very small bit of oil on that post. And then we can put in our setting lever. 
And this setting lever is fiddly. I'm like, I'll be honest with you. Like you'll see me fiddle with it a bunch. I mean, if you look at this thing wrong and it doesn't like the, you know, the look you give it or you breathe on it, it's going to come off, uh, you know, until you get that setting lever spring put into place, you'll see me mess with it a bunch. And there's multiple levels and I'm fiddling with it here to make sure I've got it in the right spot. But every time I think it's right, I bump it and it kind of comes, it moves some, again, I'm just messing with it here just to make sure I've got it in the right spot. And you'll see me kind of push the crown in and out and make sure it's engaging with that setting lever and okay, everything's looking good thus far, but that will not be the last time you see me adjust this thing. Cause again, I, I, I look at it wrong and it moves on me. So this spring here is for the setting wheel lever complete. And that's a really long name for a part that, um, I just called the Texas part. Uh, <laughs> the reason I call it that is because the plate of that part looks a lot like the state of Texas. So whenever I'm looking at it, I, you know, I, I had to look up the name to remember it to say in the video, but I just call it the Texas part. So we're beginning that spring into place now and I'm making sure it's seated down correctly all the way down. There we go. Now it dropped into place. But we get that in and we'll lubricate the post for our Texas part. And there it looks like an upside down Texas right now but we need to lubricate a few points in this per the manual. And I think I'm getting a little bit better of holding that stuff steady and lubricating it like that for the camera. It's awkward. But uh, now we need to take this spring we just installed, and I'm just gonna kind of keep this in real time here. No edits or anything, but we need to hold this spring back when we install this part, because it's gonna capture part of the Texas part. So there we go. We got the spring back and I'll bring the part in with my tweezers. Here we go. And again, it's kind of upside down. Imagine if we flipped this, you know, view 180 degrees, it's very much like the state of Texas, but you can see how that spring engages that. There we go. All good. And so the lubrication on the keyless works, there's so much going on, you know, parts contacting other parts and all that. You know, the manual doesn't, I mean, it would give you an arrow to say lubricate here, but there's three little spots maybe in that whole area that actually make contact. So as I'm building this up, I'll start applying grease to more and more. So the Texas part engages with the setting lever. We got that greased. We'll put a little bit of grease here where the spring goes on the back side of that, just like that. And we can move on. I'm going to clean up just a bit of the excess real quick. There we go. And one more spot here. And you can see I knocked that setting lever loose. Stupid setting lever. <laughs> I'm telling you, that thing loves to move on you. And then the post on the setting lever, where the setting lever spring is going to engage, applying a bit of grease there. And then a couple on the flats right here. That's where the setting lever spring is going to press down on that. And there's heavy wear marks on there. I mean, there's never not tension on that part ever. So a little bit of grease there. Now we can put our setting lever spring into place. So we're getting the screw down, but not fully tight. And I'm going to lubricate inside of these little slots here. That's where it's going to engage with the setting lever. So when you pull the crown out to each position and it clicks into place, that's that notch kind of sitting into each of those little spots on the setting lever spring. So there we go. We got the spring into place on the setting lever. And now I can tighten this thing down. And now that setting lever isn't going to move on us. Thankfully. <laughs> okay. So now we get to install our yoke spring and applying a little bit of grease here on that yoke spring. Once that's down, we'll go ahead and move this back and set it on the other side of the yoke to apply tension. We'll I'll switch it over here to the microscope view so you can kind of see what I'm doing here. There we go. So we'll pull this back and there we go. Quite a bit of tension on that yoke spring. But as you can see, some of my grease I put down there, we'll just clean up the excess. There we go. A little bit of excess on the setting lever spring as well. Okay. So next up is the rocker for the day date corrector. 
So we'll lubricate the post for that. There we go. That's into place. There's a little contact point where that is going to engage with the setting lever. So I'm lubricating where those two are going to touch. And then a little bit of oil on the shoulder of that screw for that part. Perfect. That's in place. We'll do a bit more cleanup with Rodico. I've always got that handy and sometimes I'll see a spot. It may not even be a spot. I mean, it could be a spot on the part and not dust or anything. Um, just double checking movement to make sure I don't have that shoulder pinching anything. That rocker lever looks good. And another spot here, it's going to engage with the rocking lever itself right there on that point. So I'm just kind of lubricating that. This is the post for the day jumper or date jumper rather. And I'm just cleaning up a little bit of oil I got on the top of that post. That day jumper and spring are integrated into one part. Uh, typical Seiko fashion. Granted, this one is quite different than the ones we've shown on the channel previously in shape, but in function, it works the exact same. And I'm going to lubricate with some heavier grease, the tip of that, where when spring is tension is on that spring, it's going to touch the main plate and that's going to be the heavy contact point. So we'll lubricate that. And while I have this here and nothing else in the way, I'm applying a little bit of 9010 to the faces of the jumper where it's going to in engage with the date wheel. So easier to do it now than later, but you can do it later just as easily. But with that in place, we could put on our spring for the day date corrector. And if you'll kind of, I'm going to go ahead and screw this down, but not all the way, just the same way we did with the setting lever. But what I didn't do, I didn't screw it down far enough. So it's not actually on that other post properly. And if you'll notice, I'm going to apply some grease here and then we'll pull this spring back to apply tension. But as I do watch that post, it's actually going to come off of it and I don't actually even notice it until I go to screw it down, but it'd be a little bit touchy. Nope. Didn't go on. We'll try it again. There it goes. So we got the spring applied and I brought my screwdriver over to tighten the screw down. I'm like, Oh, that doesn't look right. It's off the post. So now I got to, I want to see if I can, correct this without undoing the spring, which is not terribly difficult, but you know, to redo the spring, but try to get that post on and I do, but the other one's not prop properly on there. So we'll get that done. And the other one comes off and I'll reset that again. There we go. Got it. Now I can tighten my sp screw down. I think if I screwed the screw down further initially, it probably wouldn't have happened, but no big deal. One more time here, a little bit of grease right there. And then the post for the quick set mechanism. So here is that quick set mechanism. This is actually the part that I repaired. Um, the, I didn't replace this part. The repair is, so I'm going to add an arrow here. And just the gear on that part is, the factory ones are made of plastic and whatever material the original plastic was over time, they begin, they'll split and then the wheels unusable. It doesn't work. The fix is, um, to re just replace the wheel. You can't, you have to disassemble that part, replace the wheel. There's a couple pieces in there, but you just replace one piece of it, assemble it all back together, use a staking set to reset everything. And then there you go. There is a gentleman in Australia who makes replacement wheels out of, out of steel like this one. Um, we don't have that separation issue anymore. There's actually people who've bought factory original new old stock parts that are 50 something years old in the original, you know, packaging and they're split. So a metal wheel is a permanent fix. This watch already has that. That's what I've replaced. There's actually someone who, uh, there's another watch channel I watch regularly. I love his content much bigger than mine, but, um, he recently did a video where he disassembled one of these movements and, you know, he was talking about that being a common issue. And he said there was someone on like his Facebook group that he has someone on there prints three, three D prints, those wheels out of some kind of material, which I thought's pretty interesting. Uh, the source for those wheels that I get, it's a, uh, 
gentleman out of Australia who makes them and they're great. They work fantastic, but, uh, it could take several weeks to, for me to get parts in, but I mean, he, they always work, but, uh, I may kind of research into that a bit further on that, on that group and, um, see what he's making those out of and, uh, source my next one from him if I need it, but that's those wheels. So we got the third wheel in and the hacking lever in, and we're going to get the spring in and, um, hope and pray and talk politely and whisper sweet nothings into its ear and ask it nicely if it will remain in place and not fly out as we reassemble the rest of this watch. Technically you can install it before you install the bridge. It can be a bit fiddly, but, um, we're going to go with it here and, uh, hope it stays in place. But here we go with our escape wheel. We got that found its pivot. And so the driving pinion on this second wheel needs to be lubricated. And I'm just kind of putting a little snippet of the manual that shows the lubrication points for that. We'll go ahead and pop that into place. It's a bit easier to put this wheel in now than if you have the mainspring barrel barrel in place. It's uh, it's, it's still a bit fiddly to get that pinion all the way through and down to the other side and engaged with the minute wheel, but um, it's easier now. And then we can just kind of, slide the barrel in a bit from the side. There we go. And that seats in. Now we're good. Now we can lubricate our fourth wheel. Two little spots on there and we can get that installed. I'm just very lightly. I just basically let gravity take it down and I'm just making sure that it's engaged with the the pinion on the escape wheel and on the third wheel and everything's looking good there. So on our differential wheel, uh, there's a, some specific lubrication required for this. Um, we need to lubricate two spots on this gear, a couple teeth, but on two different spots on the wheel. And then I'm going to go ahead and lubricate the pivots on this while I'm here just with a tiny bit of oil and fumble around with my tweezers a little bit. <laughs> I'll flip this part over and do the exact same thing to the other side. Uh, a couple teeth on each side of this wheel on two different spots of this wheel. And then just a bit to the pivot on this. And basically that's acting a lot like the reverser wheels on some more typical Swiss stuff. We've had some on the channel um, that you treat with V105, which is basically alcohol in 9010. That may actually work just fine on this, but I'm just kind of following exactly what the manual shows on that. It pretty much accomplishes the same task of what you need to have lubricated. But here's the second reverse idler with those dual jewels. We'll get that into place. And then we need to lubricate the teeth of this wheel a little bit. Okay. Lastly, before we put the bridge on, we need to lubricate the crown wheel. And since this crown wheel is non-removable, it's riveted into place, but, uh, just lubricating two points on there. We're good to go there. And now we can lubricate the upper pivot for the fourth wheel, because once we put the bridge in place, that will no longer be accessible. But now we've got what? One, two, three, four, five different pivots. We have to line up on this bridge. So, uh, we'll give it a shot here and then try the tapping trick. See if we can get this thing to seat. And I noticed as soon as I started doing it, that whole bridge moved. Ooh. So I'll put this back into place, tap it a little bit lighter and see if we can, I saw it drop down a little bit and see if we can align these pivots, get this thing on. And when I checked it under high magnification, the one pivot holding it up was actually the biggest pivot should have been the easiest one to get in outside of the mainspring barrel, but that differential wheel, but you saw it drop down there when I adjusted that differential wheel. So with that done, everything's in place and we can go ahead and put our screws in and make sure that the wheel train moves freely, get everything torqued down properly. Now I'm going to go ahead and lubricate the wheel train just while I'm here. That's our second wheel and our mainspring barrel. And then I'll flip the movement over and lubricate. There's our mainspring barrel on the other side. You can see that jewel there that we installed doing its job nicely. 
clean up a bit of the excess right there. And so the rest of the wheel train and for the third wheel, uh, one of the things, the downside of me assembling the movement the way I did is this cover plate for the minute wheel is in the way and covers the jewel for the third wheel. So I got to remove that real quick and replace that. Um, not a huge thing. And funny enough, that's not the last time I'm going to take that plate off. <laughs> You'll see me reassemble it. I take it off once more before we're said and done. And actually I didn't have to, but it was just almost muscle memory. You know, um, I'll explain why at the time, but that's going to come off one more time before we're all said and done. So now we can install our click spring. And again, this one's should be very simple. Um, I make a mess of it <laughs> as you'll see, but, uh, it should pop in there pretty easily. It's all one piece, but I screw it up. There you go. So we'll try it again. If I learn how to use my tools, ah, there we go. Okay. Springs in place. And I thought I saw a little something on the, the spring. So I'm just double checking. I think we're good. So now we can install our ratchet wheel. And so since the barrel, the hole in the ratchet wheel is square and there's a square cuts on the tip of that barrel arbor, uh, just align those up and make sure that the click spring is between two teeth and that it sits down flush. And once it does, we can go ahead and screw that down into place. Once we get the screw all the way down, I'll just brace the wheel with my little plastic tip tool, make sure it's actually properly tightened and we can move on to the pallet fork. So we'll get this in and, uh, I'm sacrificing the view on the other two cameras. I've changed my lighting where they look terrible now, but the microscope footage looks good. Uh, because I wasn't pleased with the footage from some of the previous videos. Uh, you can't really see it too well. So we're going to show the microscope this time. And I think I actually got really lucky right there. I just double checked and that pivot is in the jewel. Just double check and move it and it's there. We're good. So, um, yeah, go ahead and tighten that down. We change the lighting so you can see that the other cameras. And when I have one going to, when I have the lights on the main cameras, the microscope footage is really dark. And if I turn the lights up bright enough for the microscope where it looks good, the main cameras are too dark. I don't know a whole lot about cameras, but uh, there's probably a solution to that. I just don't know it. But uh, with a little bit of power added, I'm just checking the unlocking and unlocking of the barrel, make sure power transfers looks good. I'm looking at the locking depth and everything else on the stones on the, I mean, way too much to get into the main video there, but uh, we'll check in that. I'll probably do a video for patron members about that one of these days. So we'll, we lubricate the exit stone and just with the lightest touch possible that I can do, applying that to five teeth at a time. And we'll repeat that two more times. So now we can install our balance. We have the hack disengaged and I'm doing a little bit of picture in a picture here. That way you can see what I see through the microscope and then the main camera view. This may be way too much, you know, too distracting. I, I don't know. You let me know in the comments if you would please. But, uh, I just figured I'd show both of these camera views and the balance didn't start at first. So I went to zoom in my camera and when I came back to touch the movement holder to rotate it, I bumped it into place where it should be. <laughs> and uh balance came alive so uh you know i'll take a win when i can get it so we get the screw tightened down and we'll put it on the time grapher so this watch has been running for 24 hours uh full wind and then 24 hours and you know some a bit of regulation so we'll kind of let this run i'm just going to keep it in one long shot and you'll see the amplitude uh you know it's kind of it's settling in Amplitude is going to remain in the two thirties. Our beat air is fantastic. Our rate looks fantastic. Again, we're losing a bit of amplitude because of that upper pivot on the escape wheel where it's flat and not, uh, you know, capped or, or, you know, domed. So there's a bit more friction there. And if I had, uh, the proper jacket tool part, I could address that, but it's going to run fine. Um, a replacement mainspring would have might helped, but, uh, after 24 hours, amplitude in the 230s, after a week of this thing running, that same in the same setting that amplitude is probably going to be in the 240s, maybe even reach 250. I'm super pleased with that. That watch is running beautifully. Um, I love it. So we're going to move on because those are great numbers. I'm, I'm really pleased with it. So we're lubricating the rest of the parts here for the uh, dial side of the watch. The calendar works and the uh, 
a one piece left for the motion works. So we're going to put our calendar driving wheel and that little notch on there is going to move the date wheel. And there you go. Uh, you notice the minute wheel and the cover plates removed <laughs> and now I'm re reattaching it. The reason I did that is because I'm so used to, you know, cannon pinions being friction fit. I immediately, you know, if I don't like pressing that cannon pinion on if the minute wheels in place, cause there's a chance the teeth could go on top of one another and damage something. So I immediately just took that off. And then when I, as soon as I was going to put it back on, I'm like, Oh yeah, this is not a friction fit cannon pinion. So, um, I could have literally just put it back on and, did it and you'd never know I took it off, but I figure that's not honest. So, um, I did, I took it off and then realized that it didn't need to, but there you go. So the rest of the parts are in, there's our hour wheel going into place. And now we can put on our day driving wheel. And that little notch that it surrounds is going to move it around as it rotates. And then it's also going to engage with the date wheel. That's all done. Now this little wheel here is what the quick set function is going to turn in order to turn the day wheel. And we do not lubricate that per the manual. It doesn't need it. Now we can put on our date wheel. So that drops into place. I'm going to move the date jumper and move it back and set it back in between two teeth, just like that. And now we can put on our date or day jumper plate. So this plate here covers part of the date wheel. So it won't rise up, but it also has that little finger on it, which is the jumper for the day wheel. And I went ahead and applied the tiniest amount of 9010 to that jumper. I don't have it on camera, but uh, that got done. Making sure those two screws are tight. And then we have one more cover plate for this side. That's held on my one screw. With that done, we can put on our day wheel. So we'll drop this into place. And I really like this day wheel because it's got these large openings in there where it's easy to get a tool in to pull back that jumper. There we go. So we got the jumper set in place and now we can put on our little C clip and these C clips. Um, if you're unfamiliar, there's a flat side and a, a beveled side. And so if you're ever doing one of these, uh, put the beveled side down. It'll, that clip will snap in in either orientation. It'll work in either orientation, but if you have the flat side down, it makes it unpleasant to remove it again. You basically got to get a razor blade underneath it to, to pull it up. But if the beveled side's down, you can get a tool underneath it to uh, remove it again. But just a quick function check of the quick set and everything seems to work. Now I loosened the dial feet screws. So you'll see where the dial feet will go into that little hole there. And then the shoulder of that screw will squeeze onto it. And that's what holds the dial in. So now we can install our dial and dial spacer. That sits down quite nicely. And then we'll just retighten those two dial feet screws just like this. So before we install the hands, I want to see if I can clean them up a little bit. I didn't want to go so far as to use, you know, solutions or naphtha, uh, which I've had good success with sometimes. But uh, I'm just trying this method here, uh, and it seemed to work pretty good. I mean, under macro, you're going to see a mark in everything. When the watch is on your wrist, these hands look beautiful. But uh, just clean off what I can very gently. Now we can go ahead and set the hands. So what's nice about a movement with a hack feature is that when you have a hacking feature, you can engage it right at the moment that you the date flips over. And that way the watch won't continue to run. So if you can settle your hands at the 12 o'clock position, they will never move. And you, the hand alignment becomes a lot nicer and easier. You don't, you may not be a minute or two off by the time you get to the next hand, but we've got those in. Now we got our seconds hand on, you notice it is not moving right now because the hack is engaged. So we get that pressed into place. And now what I can do is reach around here and push the crown in disengage the hack and it comes to life. And we'll just take a look here and make sure that nothing's touching. Ooh, nice. Okay. So, well, before you freak out <laughs> in the movement holder, that's touching the dial spacer, not the dial. I made triple sure of that, but, uh, I got to get all this assembled before we could put, you can't do this once it's in the case. So, uh, we'll get it fully assembled and fully regulated. 
uh, before that. So this is the first reverser idler wheel. Lubricate the pivot on that and the spot where this little retaining clip is going to hold that wheel down. And then we can slide that retaining clip into place. There we go. And reattach this screw. Awkward silence. Okay. Now our oscillating weight. And you notice I didn't lubricate the post for that oscillating weight. The inside portion of that bearing is not going to move. So we'll lubricate the bearing itself. Get that screw tightened down. And then usually what I'll do is I'll just lubricate half of the, the roller bearings or you know, the ball bearings inside that and uh, work that around. I double checked, uh, you know, uh, in shake on that thing and it, the bearings not worn out. It looks great. And I'm just going to give it a test. I'm making sure that the rotor is not touching anything. Nothing's rubbing. And I'm also just making sure that everything's working good and that it's winding the watch regardless of which way we rotate that rotor. So that all looks fantastic. So now, um, it'll stay out of the case for a while. We're going to do final regulation, but speaking of the case, so here's the case as it looks as received. The owner of the watch, we know we were talking about it. He wanted to see if we could refinish the case. And I'm looking for any excuse to try my hand at that little homemade lapping setup I had again. So, um, although this is not bad, we're going to try to do it as best we can, but only the case. He wants to leave the case back as original. I'm kind of liking the more and more I think about it. So I will just say this right now, folks. Uh, this footage is not good. I, uh, <laughs> You get to see good shots of my knuckle, but, <laughs> and, uh, I didn't think about it, but I had the cameras on autofocus. So it's focusing on my hands and not the watch. There's like eight seconds out of 20 minutes of usable footage. So we're stuck with it as it is. Again, you can see my knuckles. I hope you like them, but there's like one shot in here where you can actually see what I'm doing. And then it may be a bit fuzzy, but I'm going to put some stuff in here so you can kind of get the idea. But this sander is going through a voltage regulator to slow it down as much as possible. Although it's still much faster than a lapping machine, but I'm starting with much higher grit paper, trying to remove as little material as possible. And that's about the best shot I got. Uh, everything else is fuzzy and just terrible. I promise you folks, the next time I do this, I'm going to figure this out and it's going to be a lot better. I'll probably have the camera overhead or something. Every time I bring the camera out here and, uh, film in this area, it's just, a, leaves a lot to be desired. I put a lot of thought into the bench setup. I need to put that same amount of effort into this. So, but there you go. So this is what it looks like after the first round of lapping. I haven't touched the top at all. I'll re address that later and rebrush it, but just all the sides, there's three different angles, uh, that I've addressed. This is all after the first round at a thousand grit, but you can see the case lines. Uh, I'm very happy with how it turned out. I think this is, I, I probably speaking, honestly, I'm, I'm really proud of it. I mean, not having the proper tools and just trying to come up with something on my own. I don't think I probably, you know, I probably couldn't ask for more than that. And so I'm super pleased with it. So now what I'm doing with a hard felt wheel and some gray dialects, this is cutting compound. And if, you know, it's, everything is, you know, they call it polishing, but right now we're cutting this. And so I'm really, t I can very easily destroy case lines with this. So I'm doing my best to follow these case lines and keep them as intact as I possibly can. Um, especially all the effort with the lapping, trying to, you know, set those properly, but this is going to remove the heaviest of scratches and smooth it over that way with the, the final polish, which is this on a softer cloth mop and on stainless steel, I'm using green dialects. You know, this takes hardly any time at all. So when you're cutting, that takes five times the amount of time than the actual final polish should take just a couple minutes. Um, there's a couple of videos. Uh, someone even asked me to find it and I tried and I couldn't find it, but I know it's on YouTube somewhere. I've watched it a few times, but it's a guy who does, he is a polisher for like gets jewelry store stuff in and, but he was going over watches in his process. And 
You know, he was like, you'll spend 45 minutes cutting a case and doing all that and going through different stages. And he's like, yeah, final polish. He's like two, three minutes, maybe. <laughs> you know, And that's a lot of like the actual polish is very short. But so here I'm applying some brushing. We're starting with some 320 grit, 320 grit paper. And I'm just applying brushing like that, using that wood as a guide and it won't mark the stainless steel case. And I didn't think to get footage of that. I'll, I'll show you footage of the entire case here in just a moment um, when I have it assembled. But for now, we're putting the movement back in to the case and I'll put the stem back in and you see once it clicks into place, that seconds hand will come on just like that. With that done, uh, we can take our gasket next. I clean this with some IPA and uh, this is as nice as a brand new gasket. We'll kind of get this all in there. That one little corner is a bit high, but as soon as we put the crystal on there and all that, it'll kind of put it into place. You know, that was facing away from me, so I didn't see it, but um, it, as soon as you press it down on the crystal, it comes off. The crystal, I went over with poly watch a few times and removed the minor scratches that were in it. You've seen that probably a hundred times. And now we can put this case on. And so once we have it on there, I'll kind of tilt it up just like this. And we'll snap on one side at a time. Here, one and two. There we go, folks. You mean, and as simple as that is, that case is pretty darn tight, I gotta say. But with that, we'll take a look at the watch here and you can kind of see under my bench lights, it's uh, <laughs> that brushing is really reflective. It's re honestly kind of hard to get a shot of this thing at, you know, an honest shot. But I wanted to, under these bright lights, I mean, it's super reflective. But I'm, I'm really proud of the polish, the case lines, the transition between brushing and polish, I think, is really crisp. Um, I'm proud of having done that, just being, you know, a hack who does this as a hobby. I, I, I like it. I think it looks good. So, uh, but I uh, just kind of want to show you how it turned out. Not hide anything from you. Nothing like that. There's, this is a smudge magnet. I can tell you that, you know, um, <laughs> but uh, anything high polished, it will be. So now we can go ahead and put our strap on. And uh, I wasn't sold on this strap at first, but it's kind of grown on me. I, I like it now, but uh, it's a really nice strap. We'll put that on there and I'll just put it on the wrist. You can take a look at it. Let me know what you think. But uh, yeah, I think this thing turned out beautifully. It actually, it's this watch wears great. It's very thin and um, I absolutely love it. Um, I find it kind of difficult again to photograph this kind of stuff, but uh, we'll kind of show it to you here. The last shot in this video is a shot of me wearing it outside in sunlight. You can actually really see the dial and how it looks it. You really, it's an honest view of what this looks like, not under these bright bench lights, but take a look here. I have my little, my George Daniels watchmaking book in the background. That's way more advanced than I'll ever be. But ladies and gentlemen, here's the finished watch. You can see it there. This is the video. I sure appreciate you joining me here today. If you like this content, please like, and subscribe. I really would appreciate it. It means a lot to me. I really hope you enjoyed the video again and thank you so much. Take care and we'll see you on the next one.